Hello, and welcome to the second best paper session. We still go in alphabetical order. But before we continue with our awards announcements and presentations, we have a word from the sponsor of this second session, which is Autodesk. Our fourth best paper award goes to visualization, sorry, time spines, sketch based authoring of flexible and idiosyncratic timelines by Anna Offenbanger, Matthew Bremer, Fanny Chevalier, and Tafani Sandilas. The justification is this creative paper introduces an impressive novel authoring tool to support freeform sketching with data. Specifically, the paper follows a technically strong approach to support visually communicating chronological narratives which do not follow a linear development. Overall, the work supports expressive and creative styles of visualization, pushing further the state of the art in free form drawing of data visualizations. Anna, please come up. Hello. Hello. There we go. OK, so I have a microphone. All right. Hello and welcome. I am Anna Offenwanger, and I will be presenting the work Time Splines, Sketch-Based Authoring of Flexible and Idiosyncratic Timelines. I'll be presenting the work on behalf of myself and my colleagues, as mentioned, Matthew Bremer, Fanny Chevalier, and Theophanis Sandilas. OK, so getting started. So timelines are very important for storytelling with data, but traditional linear timelines don't cover the wide range of different conceptualizations of time. Previous research has looked at the practical uses of timelines with unusual shapes, for example, using spirals to convey the cyclical nature of temporal events, also the use that unusual shapes can have to improve memorability. In this work, we are particularly interested in what we are calling idiosyncratic timelines, which are similar to Bremer et al's uh, classification of arbitrary timelines, except that we focus on this notion that a timeline with an unusual shape will often encode a meaning that is unique to the author. Something else we have to take into account when dealing with storytelling and time is that in narrative, time is not always linear. We see this a lot in film where they will include ellipses to compress boring bits of the narrative or time dilation to emphasize significant moments. In this particular work, we are interested in supporting authoring, specifically authoring for idiosyncratic timelines. When looking at authoring, if we look at existing idiosyncratic timelines, one of the things we notice is that a lot of them do not include data. This could be due to the lack of support for such visualizations in traditional tools, and therefore the technical skills needed to create such visualizations. Something else that we don't necessarily see in existing visualizations is that when you start authoring an unusual timeline, it is often hard to envision what the data is going to look like on this unusual shape. Therefore, when authors are creating such timelines, they often have to go through multiple iterations to get to the final result. Tools looking to support this kind of visualization will necessarily need to support this as well. All right, so that gives us our design considerations for supporting idiosyncratic timelines. First one, obviously, we need to support custom timelines. Secondly, we want to support heterogeneous data mapping. And finally, we want to support an iterative workflow. So in response, we built the tool TimeSplines. TimeSplines has two main views. On the left, we have the canvas view, where we are manipulating the visuals. And on the right, we've got the data drawer, where we can load in multiple data sets. I'm now going to go through a short example of somebody using this system. In this particular scenario, the author has just reached an important milestone in their hobby of long distance running, and they want to reflect on their journey by creating visualization. So 
the author starts by loading in their data sets, which includes both uh, event data as well as statistical information, and visualizing that on a straight line. They immediately notice a large gap in their data and add additional information to explain that gap. At first, they think they'll de-emphasize the section with an ellipsis, but then they change their mind. Instead, they decide to visualize it with this sort of loop shape to symbolize ending up right back where they started. They add some additional information to this loop to explain what was happening, as well as a hand-drawn annotation to kind of capture the feel of that time period. Now that they've completed that, their temporal representation is set, so they can add in their second data set, as well as some, il as some illustrative media that they have available. They finish up by styling their visualization. Okay. <laughs> So when designing time splines, we focused on the following design goals derived from the previous design considerations, as I mentioned. Uh, supporting a flexible representation and manipulation of time, supporting multimodal annotation, and supporting heterogeneous and cumulative temporal data. So supporting a flexible representation and manipulation of time is not only about being able to create these custom shapes, but also manipulate the shapes as well as the flow of time. TimeSpline supports the manipulation of the sh shape of the line through the ability to cut, move, and merge these idiosyncratic timelines. When making changes to the temporal representation, the system does its best to keep existing elements consistent with that changing representation. This can include moving existing elements as well as stretching and compressing drawn annotations. To control the flow of time, TimeSplines introduces the concept of time pins. Time pins link a specific date to a specific point on the line. They can be moved to change the passage of time or removed to return the passage of time to a constant rate. When we look at annotation, um, when we look at annotation in existing visualizations, we see a lot of different um, ways people annotate graphs. As I mentioned, TimeSpline supports this not only through the ability to add text annotation, image annotation, and drawn annotation, but also through linking those annotations to the temporal representation. This enables the annotations to become responsive to changes in that temporal representation and starts to blur the line between annotation and data. That line is further blurred through our support for heterogeneous and accumulative temporal data. TimeSpines takes the lazy data binding approach where visual elements are first and foremost visual elements and data binding is applied on the fly as needed. At any point in the authoring process, an author can add additional data to the graph and that data is attached in a two-way binding. Changes made to the data table will be reflected in the visualization and vice versa. In addition, authors can add text annotations which are reflected in the table. By doing this, we sort of blur the line between what we consider to be annotation and what we consider to be data. Moving on to evaluation. To evaluate um, the expressivity of the timelines tool, we took a three-pronged approach. First off, doing a reproduction study where we asked 12 participants to reproduce an existing visualization. A freeform study where we gave participants uh, time on their own to create a visualization with data they found of interest. And authoring a gallery ourselves of visualizations. So. In the reproduction study, as I mentioned, we asked participants to reproduce a visualization, namely this visualization we have here on the left. Um, participants were not required to adhere exactly to the example given, and the results show that even in a simple reproduction, time spline supports a wide variety of different styles. In the freeform study, we asked four participants who were visualization uh, researchers or, and one designer to take some time to create a visualization on their own with a data set that they found of interest. What we saw was that all participants in, or utilized metaphor within their visualizations. For example, P13 did a spatio-temporal map of elevation data from a mountain bike ride that she took. She included loops within the temporal line to indicate places of non-motion, in other words, when they took breaks in the ride. In contrast, also similarly, P15 also did a path, but in this case, it was a purely metaphorical life path. She visualized the events from the fictional biography of Forrest Gump, overlaying them on a figurative path element, indicating how this life sort of ended up in a specific point. Within our gallery, among other things, we demonstrate the pragmatic uses for um, idiosyncratic timelines. 
In the visualization on the left, this is a visualization of 400 years of my own family history. I use the shape of the line to wrap around the media elements, thereby incorporating them into the visualization design. On the left, this is a visualization done by my colleague Matthew Brammer. He visualized um, uh, numerical data pulled from various music streaming services, and he chose to go with a um, line shape that bent outwards in order to incorporate the album covers around the numerical data. Incorporating image and numerical data is actually quite tricky, which rolls us into our limitations and future work. So, along with the uses for idiosyncratic timelines, we naturally ran into the challenges. As P13 puts it, it is not possible to have both very interesting curves and the data super readable everywhere. P13 ran into this issue with the sharp curves in her graph, which made the elevation data kind of hard to read in places. She overcame this by carefully aligning her axis so that the peaks in the elevation data stood out as far as possible from the graph, thereby highlighting those victory moments. Uh, my colleague overcame the readability issue by ensuring that all the curves in his graphs were fairly shallow, thereby making the numerical data easier to read. So previous research has looked at how to overcome these challenges, for example, the transmogrification technique, and it'd be very interesting to see how techniques like this could be applied in a tool like TimeSplines. As a final note for future work, as I mentioned, TimeSplines takes this uh, approach of blurring the line between annotation and data. This opens up this interesting question of what do we consider annotation versus what do we consider data? Previous research has looked into this. I would say the data hunches work by Lynn A. All sort of falls into this category, but there's still a lot of work to be done on this interesting conceptual question. Wrapping up, if you are interested in the timelines, Time Splines tool, it is available online on the Git uh, Exitu GitHub, and if you're interested in this work, please fire us a line. And I think with that, we are open to questions. Thank you. Hi, thank you for your very nice talk. Uh, it sounds like a quite interesting tool to not only visualize data, but also to talk also about the data. So do you have a multi-user mode maybe in future work uh, where you can, um, with your colleagues, discuss data, highlight important stuff and like this, things like this? So we did not include a multi-user mode, but the code for the application is available online. So if you're interested in doing that, it actually probably wouldn't be that difficult. It's entirely programmed in JavaScript, so all you'd have to do is slap a WebJS backend on it. Um, yeah, that'd be an interesting project for future research. Thanks. Uh, maybe a second question to us. So if you have uh, multiple users or multiple persons uh, creating a time spline for the same data, um, would it be possible to compare the same data point in their time splines? So for example, my curve against another person's curve and how we perceive the data differently? Yes, so time splines is like many um, research tools, somewhat incomplete. And one of the things that I'm sort of sad that we didn't do properly was the ability to uh, really show the links between the data table and the visualization. So we did have some you know, minor highlighting when you mouse over things in the table, but we never managed to get that really clear. So again, additional work for, that would be interesting for future. Um, Tech, what, what techniques exist for being able to highlight when, when you have this canvas where data could be just about anywhere, how do you highlight when there's links between that data within this two-dimensional space? And again, very interesting for future work. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your inspiring talk. And I have a question. When I look at your visualizations, I feel like this could be great input for generative AI. So did you like try to do that? What do you think about that idea? Yes, so to answer your question, yes, I did try it. I did not get very far. <laughs> yes, I think that it could be very interesting to be input into systems like that. Time splines, as you may notice, the uh, look of the overall look of the visualizations is kind of unfinished. Time splines is really kind of designed as a prototyping tool to be able to test out these interesting visual curves. The idea would be then that you could take that initial visualization into some other system to do the visual finishes. You can actually export all of the time splines or time splines results as SVG, and we partly did this to make it more compatible with other tools. So yes, also a very interesting thing to test for future work. Okay.
Okay, thank you. Great, thank you again. <laughs>
The interaction between stream sets and discontinuity flow leads to novel separating manifolds in the smooth regions of the vector field. We first restate some key findings from digital vector field topology. For any given smooth vector field, we can extract its critical points, which are points at which the vector field vanishes. Through Jacobian and its eigenvalues, we can characterize each critical point. The field points away from the so red source and towards the blue things. The green settles are hyperbolic, which means they have an inflowing and outflowing eigendirection. The settles generate separatrices, which divide the field into regions of similar behavior. Extraction of critical points and separatrices results in a topological skeleton, which is a strong qualitative description of the vector field. We can apply traditional vector field topology to the sliding flow within the discontinuity. Here, we look at, tra uh, at attracting sliding flows with a saddle and its separatrices and the periodic orbit, which is also a separating structure. We compute the stream sets of these 2D topological structures. From now on, black streamlines indicate non-unique flow. We can see that the separating properties of the 2D critical structures are inherited by their stream sets, which now separate other stream sets here in white. We have seen in introduction that there also can be a transition between crossing and sliding flow. This transition happens to have topological implications. First, let us examine the involved structures. We find regions of crossing flow and regions of attracting sliding flow. These regions are always separated by boundary switch points in 2D or curves in 3D, which are points at which one of the involved fields is tangential to the discontinuity. These boundary switch points or curves can be of type inbound or outbound. We can see in this example that the boundary switch curve indeed separates the crossing gray part of the discontinuity from the blue attracting sliding flow. At the boundary switch curve, the stream set changes dimensionality from 2D to 1D. Furthermore, the boundary switch curve induces a novel kind of separatrix which, uh, through which all of the stream sets flow out of the discontinuity. And equities, which are the purple manifolds that separate regions of non-unique stream sets from regions of unique streamlines. Together, these structures separate three qualitative, three different regions. These structures are consistent with time reversal, but the separatrix changes only its type. As for outbound boundary switch curves, they do not cause many faults that display separating properties. One interesting property of boundary switch curves of adjacent fields is that they can intersect, causing so-called two-fold singularities. There are three different type combinations possible. In the inbound inbound case, the separatrices switch sides and the type at the twofold singularity. The equities also switch sides and form compartments on non, of non unique flow, which are due to the attracting and repelling sliding discontinuities. Together, they highlight the amount of qualitatively different regions. The inbound outbound case displays less separating structures. This is due to the outbound boundary switch curve, which does not induce separating properties. As for the outbound outbound case, we usually, this usually results in a dimensional blow up, which means that the stream sets become volumes due to the interaction of the discontinuities and the transitivity of the equivalence class relation. We conclude this section with two basic cases of bounded sliding flow. Boundary switch curves can be closed curves, like in the example on the left, or they can intersect multiple times with, under, with other boundary switch curves to form closed regions, um, as seen in the example on the right. Discontinuities also impact traditional vector field topology in the smooth regions of the field. In this example, we will see that sliding flow can indeed bypass separatrices. This field exhibits an attracting sliding flow and a 3D settle. The settle induces separatrix, which separates two regions. Through the sliding flow, some flow can bypass the separatrix from one region into the other, negating separating properties of the separatrix, which we indicate here with the cutout region of the separatrix. The non-separating region is exactly bounded by the equatrix coming from the boundary switch curve. All initial conditions that are not separated by the separatrix are enclosed by the equatrix. Let us revisit the dry friction case from the introduction. The attracting sliding flow is bounded by an inbound and an outbound boundary switch point. 
the superatrix coming from the inbound bound switch point it re enters the discontinuity and again flows out through the inbound bound switch point, which explains the, res uh, the resulting periodic orbit. The invariant set consists, uh, consists of the source point and one large stream set. We can make this. Uh, field into, we can extend this field into a three dimensional version by making the air spring constant temperature dependent. Again, the system has one inbound and one outbound boundary switch curve. The stream that changes dimensionality at the inbound boundary switch curve. Therefore, any point on the one dimensional component of the stream set is the result of any point on the two dimensional component of the stream set. Represents an extension of vector field, of a visualization of vector field topology to discontinuous fields based on equivalent classes and stream sets. We introduce the topological structures induced by the discontinuity flow and the boundary-induced equitrices. Furthermore, we explored how these findings relate to the additional vector field topology. As this analysis was conducted on time-independent fields, the influence on t of time could be a subject for future research. Additionally, cases involving intersecting discontinuities hold significant interest. This concludes my talk. Thank you for listening. We have time for one question. Uh, thank you very much for the, for the presentation. Can you say more about the topology of this set where the discontinuity actually works? Can it also happen not on a closed curve, but on a open curve? Excuse and the me. same questions, did you, did, did you understand it? No, I did not understand the question okay. quite. So can you repeat it? Um, I'm interested in the topology of this point set where the discontinuity actually happens. In your examples in 2D, it was either a closed curve okay. or just a cutting through the whole domain. Can it, so the question is in 2D, can it be an open curve with a starting point and an end point? And in 3D, can it be, for instance, a Möbius band or something like this? So I still didn't get the question quite right. Um, could you be, just tell me on which slide this would be? No, it was on all the slides. On all the slides, okay. <laughs> then maybe we'll just shift it to later. Or um, if you want to repeat it once more. <laughs> um, yeah, I did uh, not let, get the... Let, let, me, let me one more try. Okay. Two, all the 2D cases. Yes. All the curves of discontinuity you showed yes. were either a curve cutting the whole domain yes. or just a closed curve. Is it possible that this curve is just an open curve segment starting somewhere and ending somewhere? Well, usually not. Um, so you have, um, the question is whether these curves can be uh, semi-open, am, am I right? Mm -hmm. So that they have actually just a segment of a curve. Yes. So um, let me just think about it and e yes, they can. So they should be able to do this. Um, since you have a continuous, so you have, a, you mean this boundary switch curve or you, do you mean the actual discontinuity? This is the curve of discontinuity. This is the curve of discontinuity? Yes, it can be bounded. It wants, uh, we have these boundaries between sliding and crossing mm -hmm. flow, and crossing flow can, con can sh shift into a continuous flow, at which mm -hmm. point then you would actually have the, the, the transition between a cross, uh, continuous flow and crossing flow, and then from crossing flow towards sliding flow. So that's of course possible. Okay, the second part of the question, let's take it offline. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Our sixth award goes to Vortex Lens Interactive Vortex Core Line Extraction Using Observed Line Integral Convolution by Peter Rautek, Xingdi Zhang, Bernard Voshishka, Thomas Teusel, and Markus Hadviger. The justification is this work presents a novel and creative contribution to the analysis of vortex structures in 2D unsteady flows. It proposes a new interactive approach that keeps the user in the loop during reference frame optimization, allowing for the rapid exploration of real-world flow data. The paper utilizes a clever iterative optimization scheme that can be executed asynchronously during user interaction, alleviating the need for any pre-computation, representing a clear advancement of the state of the art. By explicitly exploring the connection between the mathematical formulation and physical meaningfulness, the paper further contributes to the foundations of flow visualization. Peter, would you please come up?
Hello everyone, so my name is Peter Rautek from King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. And today I want to present to you a Vertex Lens. I just need to find my clicker. Um, which is a very simple idea and we can see the tool uh, here basically uh, working on this video. So the idea is we use uh, line integral convolution in a, in a conventional way, how, how, um, how it's been around for a very long time. But then inside the lens, lens region, we actually uh, show an alternative visualization of the flow field by transforming it into an observer relative uh, visualization. And I will explain what all this means now in this talk. So let's first look at line integral convolution and why uh, it's not uh, sufficient to just use line integral convolution in the case of unsteady flow fields. Here we have a vortex visualized uh, with line integral convolution. And in this case, we are looking at a steady flow field. So if we look at particles uh, from this flow field, they would perfectly swirl around this center here that is uh, visualized using line integral convolution. So everything is good. But as soon as we go to unsteady flow fields, meaning that the velocities change over time, like here with this vector field where the vortex that seem, appears to be the same vortex as we saw before, but now is moving, then the situation changes. If we now look at a particle trajectory, like this here, we can see that it doesn't appear to swirl anymore uh, uh, around, this, um, around the center of the line integral convolution visualization. We can actually see this here, these two curves never cross, so apparently the one is not swirling up around the other one. It's hard to see here if this is a vortex at all. Sometimes it can help to look at, uh, at this in 3D and use uh, path lines. So here, the third dimension now is time, meaning that uh, we can imagine this particle flowing over time. And when we look at that, then we can see that the two particles here that are visualized with these uh, blue lines, they are clearly swirling around the common center, the, the yellow line here. Um, so this is a vortex, but it is different, this common center, from the black dot here, which is the apparent center in line integral convolution. And this is a known problem uh, for line integral convolution, that it's not actually suitable to uh, visualize unsteady flow fields. However, it's widely available. It's, uh, it's a beautiful tool, so we kind of want to keep the tool uh, and just make it also work for unsteady flow fields. And this is the idea of our project. Um, <coughs> Before I explain more about the project, I want to show some more examples of how, how wrong kind of conventional line integral convolution can go in the, in the case for uh, to the uh, unsteady flow visualization. So here, when we look at the line integral convolution, it looks like there is no vortex at all, but we can manually seed path lines and actually find uh, interactively a vortex. Um, there's another case here where the line integral convolution suggests that there is a vortex, but when we see the path lines, then we can actually observe that these path lines, yes, they do make a rotation, but if we look at multiple path lines here, then we can see they actually they co-move. They don't really swirl around the common center. They just co-move on a rotation, which is a rigid body rotation. We have developed in earlier work um, a method for inverting a rigid body motion. So here we see again path lines of the same data set, and we can uh, invert the rigid body motion to kind of visually prove that this is not a vortex. It is really just co-moving particles, and we untwist them, then we see they're all straight lines in time. So they do not, they do not move, move, but only uh, co-rotate. So it's not a vortex. So we have seen there's these different cases where the line integral convolution makes us think that there is a vortex and there isn't one, or line integral convolution makes us think there's no vortex, but there is one. And most commonly, probably, there, it will make us think that there is a vortex, but it's slightly off-centered. So here with our, with our new technique, the goal is to keep all the nice properties of line integral convolution. It's a very immediate visualization. It's uh, widely available in, in uh, software frameworks. Um, but to change it inside a lens region by changing the velocity field inside this region um, to an observed velocity field. And that basically means that we we are looking, we are searching for, um, for reference frame transformations, which we can imagine as like a, an observer moving together with the vortex. And then the velocities are basically just the velocities that this co-moving observer would record or measure. So this is the transformation that we are using. 
So how do we go from line integral convolution to observed line integral convolution, which we use in this, uh, in this lens region? Sometimes, uh, okay, let's look at a different example here. Conventional line integral convolution of a vortex street. We don't really see that there is any vortices. If we look at observed line integral convolution, we can clearly see the vortex street. So the question is, how do we go from the visualization on the left to the visualization on the right? And again, here I, I want to paint a little bit of a more intuitive picture because it's very hard to imagine what velocity transforms look like, but they have a very simple geometric interpretation. So here on the bottom, we see the kind of input data, uh, data set, and on the top, we see densely seeded path lines uh, over the whole domain. We don't see much yet because these vertices they, or the path lines, they occlude each other. But what we can do is we can now look at these path lines and transform them into a new reference frame how a, how a moving observer would, would see them. So the, the observer that co-moves with these vertices, um, uh, we can, can look at how it, it would see that. So here I show now an animation where we slowly increase the velocity of the observer, and at any time in the sequence, we see how the observer would perceive this, this flow field or these curves. So we come up with this transformation of path lines where in the end, when we, when we found the correct observer that co-moves with the vortex street, then we can finally see all these vortices that are there. And now this is exactly this geometric transformation that we can think of that's more intuitive. If we now take the tangents of these curves, it is a new velocity field, and this new velocity field is exactly what we can use for observed, uh, for observed line integral convolution. In this example, um, this was a bit too simplifying because here one co-moving observer is enough because all the vortices move in the same direction, move at the same speed. So here it works for the whole data set. We just need one reference frame transformation and we're good. In general, this is not enough. In general, we have like multiple vortex structures in a data set moving all over the place, and we have to follow them individually. So here, for example, there's two vortex structures that uh, we can't see first, or there's actually many of them, and all of them would move over time individually in different directions. So now, live, interactively, we compute this optimal reference frame transformation at a given point that's given by the user inside this lens, and then we uh, visualize um, we use observed uh, line integral convolution inside this lens with respect to the interactively computed observer. To compute this uh, reference frame transformation, we use a, a method that is based on earlier work. Um, so there's multiple papers on, on how to do that. We had to adjust it a little bit um, to make it locally work and to make it interactively work. All these ideas are mostly um, based on the idea of minimizing the time derivative. So there's the velocity field that changes over time, and we want to find the reference frame transformation that makes a time derivative minimal with respect to, this, to the transformation. Um, our optimization algorithm that does that. So um, we need to run, basically, it's an uh, inverse problem, so we, we need to use optimization to solve that. Um, and now we can have a, a closer look at uh, how, this, uh, how this algorithm works. So the user picks a point somewhere where he might suspect a, a vortex or he just slides around his mouse on the, on the input uh, field on the plane. Um, and at this point, um, we, we now try to estimate the best co-moving observer for the flow field. So um, we can think of this optimization as a search for an observer that minimizes the time derivative. And so here I have visualized um, the, the time derivative as a as color-coded uh, scalar field on, on, the, on the plane here. And the optimization method now changes the reference frame transformation to minimize this time derivative inside the lens region. So after a few iteration steps, it would com come up with, a, with the minimum it can find with a new and with a new reference frame that actually minimizes this, in this inside the region. But this is not enough because uh, now this is just at a random point that the, the user chose. So this is not really where necessarily the vortex is exactly sitting. So we need to actually also find the best point. So here, and the point is where the, where the observed velocity uh, becomes zero. So here in a second, it, uh, in a second uh, step of the, of the optimization algorithm, we actually find the point with the, with the uh, minimal um, observed velocity magnitude, 
And then we iterate these two steps until we find a joint minimum of, uh, of minimal time derivative and observed velocity. And this is now a good point for where the vertex uh, actually is, and it also gives us the reference trans uh, frame transformation that best transforms the field. We can use now this reference transformation directly again, as we have already seen before, with, uh, we, to change to observed line integral convolution inside the lens region, which might like shift uh, the vertices here. But there's another thing that we also can do with it. Since we have the reference transformation, we can also, at a given point, now advect our lens in time using this, uh, this reference uh, frame transformation or uh, observer motion, which gives us basically the next, po next best guess point for, uh, for a vortex core. And then we can again iterate this, so we run in the next time step, we run again the optimization to find the best reference frame uh, and integrate further, which allows us to extract vertex core lines. And now, because we have these vertex core lines and the possibility to advect in time, we can uh, use that to advect, to attach our lens to a vertex core line and advect the lens in time. So the user can alternate between, um, between exploration in space and in time. Here we see another example where we attach first to one vertex, then we change to another vertex, and we attach again to this vertex and follow it over time. All right, this concludes basically the whole method. Um, please visit us at vcvisualization.org. We have this talk with a little more detail um, pre-recorded there. There's a lot of papers about the uh, topic of observed flow field uh, visualization. And also there is a tutorial uh, with tutorial notes on the mathematical background of all our work. Thank you. We have time for one question. Very nice work, Peter. Um, I try to not confuse observed line integral convolution with oriented line integral convolution, which is, could easily happen with a jet lag, but my question is a different one. What about the size of your lens? I, I assume that there's an influence of it, and yes. whether you have looked in optimizing the, the size of the, the lens as well. That's right. So actually what we, what we saw in all our experiments that, okay, so there's not one lens uh, region because you want to have the visualization inside the lens and the user can kind of freely ch choose how large this lens region is. But then also we run the optimization that is based on the integral in a region to, to minimize the time derivative. And there we have found that we can keep this extremely small depending on basically on grid resolution. It's uh, most of the time it's enough to have like a, a cross of five grid points. There is other cases where you want to track features that are larger then the user has to manually select that he is now interested in a, in a feature that is very large, and he wants to see if this uh, this feature stays coherent over time. We can also do that, but it's kind of a different use case. Yeah, very nice. Thank you. Our last presentation in this session is for the Best Short Paper Award, and Jonathan Roberts is going to present it. Yes, many thanks. So the award for the Best Short Paper goes to Aidan Slingsbury, Richard Reeve, Claire Harris for their work on gridded glyph maps for supporting spatial COVID-19 modeling. So Aidan, would you like to come up and receive the award, please? So the World Committee said, sorry, <laughs> the World Committee said that the work was, oh, it's up here and not up there, recognizes that the paper is uh, an exceptional contribution to the visualization community. The technique presented in the paper is well motivated, and the authors clearly articulate their design rationale. The technique advances the state of art in multidimensional data visualization, and the details are well exposed in the paper. 
making it easy to replicate. I think that's a really important point to be able to do in our visualization community to replicate the work. And the companion video illustrates well the type of insights this technique can reveal to analysts. In summary, this is an exemplary technique paper, and we congratulate the work of the authors for their research. Aidan, thanks very much. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about this technique, which was nicely introduced. Um, so I'll be talking about grid glyph maps, uh, which are designed for depicting spatial variation in multivariate data. I'll talk about how we used it to support COVID-19 modeling, which was our case study. Uh, and I'll also talk about how it can be generalized to other uh, problems, other contexts for looking at multivariate data, including time series over, um, over space. So the context of this work was that um, I was involved in a project during the COVID pandemic, we all remember that a few years ago, where there was lots of uh, COVID modeling going on. And in the UK, Min Chen uh, organized uh, a cooperation with uh, UK visualization researchers supporting uh, COVID modelers. And I was lucky enough to be paired with uh, my two co-authors uh, co here. Uh, and so what their model did was they took um, population data for Scotland and uh, modeled the spread of COVID from there. So here we have a representation of, of uh, population data in Scotland. And um, these are inverted population pyramids with young population at the top, old population at the bottom. Um, and uh, you'll see in the big cities like Glasgow, you get a, a young population. That's what you expect in cities. Um, and the model used this data where different ages of people had different COVID uh, susceptibilities and other data to try and, uh, to, and, and model COVID uh, spread. And the output was daily uh, uh, data of how population in each grid cell uh, was partitioned amongst different susceptibility um, states. So start, uh, at the start, all the population was susceptible. And then if they got exposed to COVID, they could be symptomatic or asymptomatic. Uh, and they could go through various stages, uh, most recovering, um, some being hospitalized, uh, some unfortunately dying. So these populations in grid cells were, were, were the, susceptible, the category of COVID susceptibility was, uh, was modeled by the model. And the output was, again, grid-based data. So the, so the requirements and challenges are as follows. The challenge was the data that we were using was very high, high resolution data. It was one kilometer square data. And the existing solution the model has used was to use highly aggregated summaries to, um, to, to, to assess whether the model was producing plausible results. And they found it very hard to check local detail, whether the model was performing as expected in, in, in smaller areas. They would have to process the data separately to do that. And so the requirements that we discussed at the start was to facilitate a uh, means of exploring the multivariate data um, at multiple scales, being able to zoom in and see details where required. And our solution was this grid glyph maps idea. So in grid glyph maps, um, we, um, in, in grid cells, we aggregate the data within the grid cell and then we represent it as a glyph, placing that in the, in the grid cell. And we added various interactions. So if you zoom in, it will grid the data until you get down to the original resolution of the data. And as you zoom out, it aggregates to an average. Um, and we can also change the grid cell. And so one aspect of this technique is that you can 
have more complex glyphs inside the squares if you trade off spatial position by having large grid cells for more complex glyphs that can show more multivariate data or complex time series data. And we also had different versions of the symbols. Sorry, one step ahead. Uh, we can have um, relative ones where we look to the relative population um, structure. Um, and we also had ones where we use fading to uh, only show those with large populations. So we can draw attention to areas with, um, with uh, certain characteristics. Like this. So um, we, our tasks were to look at the spatial distribution of the, model, of the multivariate model outputs. Um, and we wanted to be able to look at um, what parameter values are needed um, and, and what specific processes, did these specific model processes have the expected effect? And also, how do model results compare? There's lots of what if uh, modeling, what if we lock down population, how the differences in the outputs be? And that was one of the uh, tasks we, we wanted to support. So I'm gonna show you four glyph designs and the comparison that we um, embedded in them and also the interactions. So you've seen the population ones. Um, sorry, not very smooth. Um, the first one I want to show you is uh, the model output one. So at the bottom here, if I zoom in, we've got the states you saw in the graph. And for each population class, we've got, um, we're, we're feeding forward through time, 30 days. And these are the different uh, categories of, this is what the spread of the virus uh, in that time. So it's animated through time. We can look, uh, use the timeline to, um, to, fill, to scroll through time. But maybe a more useful representation is to use a relative one where we fill, fill the lines there. And then when we zoom in on certain areas, and play slowly, uh, the models were able to look at how from the seed points, the spread, the, the, the speed of the spread, and how that differed from different areas. And they could zoom in and zoom out and see those at different, uh, different scales. Obviously we know that animation is not necessarily a good way of showing time, so we had another representation uh, where we looked at time series data um, so we had one, one glyph with all the information on, and to do comparison, we could switch between two model um, types. But the, uh, the, the main way we looked at model results was to use a more complex glyph, so I'll increase the resolution. Um, and here we were taking um, model, one model, subtracting one from the other, and over time seeing um, how the models compared. And zooming in on certain areas, we got different um, interesting effects where uh, it would uh, spread faster, it, for one model would spread faster, and other, another model would maybe have another peak afterwards. So, uh, is my time up? Um, so we had some feedback, uh, which uh, you'll see in the paper, there's a, there's a, there's a report for, for there. I wanted to talk about some of the issues and um, opportunities but I want to talk about an implementation you can try. So there's an observable page with an implementation, and as long as you provide the function that uh, aggregates the data, and also a function that draws the glyph, you should be able to make your own uh, glyph maps uh, from there. So I will finish here and take any questions if you have any. Okay, I have a question on behalf of Christoph Garth. Uh, in your paper, you mentioned spatial anomalies. How would you accommodate spatial anomalies in this okay. representation? Thank you, so that's a good question. So one of the limitations of the technique is that you're gridding space, and so you may lose uh, detail in there. The key is how you summarize the data and how you display it. So if you want to emphasize anomalies, you can summarize data in such a way that you uh, you take out the anom you, you identify the anomalies, for example, only showing maximum values or pulling out values that are different from an average. And then you can uh, design a glyph to, uh, to represent that anomaly. So the key is designing glyphs that show these different things. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
This concludes the second best paper session. Let's thank all the speakers again and congratulations. And we hope to see everyone in the poster session at 4.45.